Alex Liebner is part of Faith Popcorn's brain reserve. So Faith Popcorn has been known to make some of the most fascinating predictions with quite a high accuracy. Alex, if you could just unmute yourself and stand by, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about Faith and potentially start from there. Alex, what, what type of predictions has Faith made in the past? Well, she's done some incredible work over the years. I mean, she started almost 30, 30 years ago uh, predicting uh, incredible things like uh, the end of the digital, uh, the end of film and the onslaught of digital photos. Uh, she's, she did some consulting to uh, some of the big software, soft drink companies uh, many years ago saying that bottled water would be the next big thing. Uh, she invented the soda pop category. Uh, so she's really somebody who has a really solid track record in terms of her analysis and her predictions. And a lot of it has really turned into uh, multi-billion dollar businesses and industries. Brilliant. It's fascinating because one of the things you and I spoke about when, in the offline was this concept of cocooning, which I believe you're going to tap onto. So maybe, Alex, if I can have you open up and just dive straight into it, because I know that's coming up quite soon. So over to you. Thanks so much, Cameron. And thank you so much uh, to everybody who's joining us on this uh, call this morning. And I know Cameron's going to bring up the slides as we dive into the future of events. And uh, maybe to also give you some additional context to it. I, I spent uh, just over six years in the event space and uh, understand the um, the inner workings behind the scenes as well. So I think we're going to have quite an engaging conversation merging these two uh, worlds of the future and kind of where the event space is going. So one of the things that we're, uh, that, that uh, Faith Popcorn at Brain Reserve always highlights, and it's sort of almost like a guiding motto, um, and Cameron's going to bring up that, that slide for me now, is, is really, if you knew everything about tomorrow, what would you do differently today? And it's so funny, uh, uh, just about two months ago, we were presenting to, oh, geez, even more, three months ago, we were presenting to um, an audience in Durban, and we were talking about some of the things uh, that came out of the presentation that we just released beginning of the year, talking about some of the futuristic things that we could expect over the next couple of years. And one of them, we were talking about how in China, people were uh, having parties in their living room because it was just the start of this pandemic. People were starting to go into lockdown. And I think a lot of people in the audience thought this was completely ridiculous. Why would people be doing workouts and having club events and, and doing all these amazing things in their living rooms or in their bedrooms. Little did we know that almost three months later, here we all are baking banana bread and, and having exercises in our living room and in our bedroom. And we've almost followed a similar pattern much quicker than we expected. Um, so really, as we, as we move forward with this presentation, I mean, I'm really going to touch on a couple of the, the key things, uh, you know, that I think are going to be uh, short-term and long-term are going to pop up um, in, our, in our space. And Cameron, if I can ask you just to, to bring up those uh, slides for us. So one of the things that we, we practice in, in terms of brain reserve is something called applied futurism. So it's really looking at things that are actually tangible, that are sort of almost, uh, you know, almost ready to go. So there's already indicators that are showing us that this is kind of where the world is going. And it's just a question of um, how long, uh, how much, uh, you know, how long it's going to take, and what kind of catalyst is going to move us forward? And I always make this joke with people of late, where you know, how many conferences have we sat in and we've spoken about, uh, you know, digital migration and and getting the company to go into the cloud and all these amazing things? And for five or ten years, nothing has really sort of happened. I mean, everyone sort of sat in a room and nodded and said, "This is a great idea." And the moment lockdown was announced, within 72 hours. Everybody moved to their house. Everyone had access to a high-speed internet connection, um, a, a Dropbox, whatever the case is, and suddenly we were ready to go. So it's amazing how um, we've ha we have a lot of these technologies sitting in the wings, but it's taken a, an event like this to almost fast forward, fast forward us uh, into the future. So, Cameron, if we can get into uh, those, those first uh, couple of slides. So one of the things I always like to look about is, is, is what's possible, what's probable, and what's preferable. So we've touched on the possible part. What's probable is also one of those things where, you know, we don't want to be talking about sort of, you know, where are things, you know, sort of building colonies on Jupiter. We want to have a look at things that are sort of very tangible, that are things that are probably quite realistic. But also the great thing about this entire conversation, and I think this is sort of maybe also a key message to take out of today's uh, talk, is really to say what's preferable. And I think the event space right now is in such an interesting space where 
At the same time, we don't know what the future could potentially look like, but we're also in a great position to look at how we can shape that future and how we can create that future. Because I think right now there's a lot of people sitting around going, I'm not quite sure what this future is looking like. I'm not quite sure where we're going. Right now, I know that we're not having any events for quite a long time and it's really stressing me out. But at the same time, I think there's a great opportunity to say, well, we can start putting things into place because the reality is, is that right now there isn't anybody who's got a Pandora's box or a magic bullet that is going to come out of the wings and say, listen, this is what it's going to look like and this is what you need to do. So I'm hoping that some of the ideas that we share today are going to uh, possibly get you thinking about how could we start taking advantage of some of these ideas and how could we start bringing these ideas into uh, our markets and start making this happen. So, uh, Cameron, if you give me my, my next slide there. So, one of the, uh, the trends that uh, Cameron had touched on in terms of brain reserve was the cocooning. There's quite a few other trends that we're constantly tracking over the last 30 to 40 years, but cocooning is the one big one that has come up. And just to kind of really distill cocooning into its essence, it's about people moving back into their home spaces and turning that into uh, almost like a sanctuary, sort of a, a place of safety. And, and, and we've seen that more than anything else right now. And I mean, this is the best example. This is kind of where in the early 2000s, we saw the, the rise of home delivery. We saw the rise of high-speed internet. Um, we've seen the likes of Netflix and these kind of guys sort of bringing uh, movies to our house. And I think this incident and this situation that we're in right now now is going to catalyze that even more. What also makes this quite interesting is some of the information that I'm sharing with you today is also brought together by a, a bank of 10,000 trend uh, specialists that Brain Reserve taps into on, a, on an almost hourly basis and a daily basis, getting a sense of kind of where everyone in the world who are leaders in their individual industries and their sectors are kind of seeing things happening and started, started seeing the future bleeding into the present. Cameron, if you uh, pop me my next slide. So let's go into the cocooning. And, and really what we've identified right now, and there's a, a whole other talk around this called, uh, uh, focused on the seven, seven different types of cocooning that we're seeing right now. But really what we've seen with everybody in lockdown is this deep cocooning, this, this need to, to stay at home from a, from a purely governmental perspective. But we do believe that this is going to continue. And, and this is going to splinter into seven types of different cocoonings um, that people are going to... Uh, be spending more time at home and there's more things that are going to be driven to the home. And I think that's going to be quite an important catalyst in terms of uh, the eventing space. If we look at some sort of, uh, if you look, take a step back and look back into, into the past, it was quite interesting that in the past, we, we had people going to classical concerts because we didn't have the technology to listen to music on vinyl and then eventually on iPods. That evolution happened. Uh, we had people going uh, and taking entertainment to the theaters. So they went to the theater, they watched a play, and then they would go home. Uh, then we had the onslaught of television and radio, and that fell away. So I'm feeling that the event space is going to probably go through a very similar evolution where we've had this live element, we've had people used to going to live spaces, but that the idea of experiencing an event at home or experiencing an event uh, through technology is going to become more and more of a thing. And there's one interesting uh, slide that I'm going to touch on just now that, uh, that really uh, is quite promising. And I think uh, these, kind of, uh, in, these kind of pandemics and these kind of moments in time, these sort of black swan events as we're experiencing right now are great catalysts to be pushing that kind of technology. So Cameron, if you uh, bring up uh, my, my next slide for me there. Uh, so one of, the one of the things that we're going to, we're going to see is the redundancy of, of office spaces and are probably quite a few other spaces as well because I think tied into that deep cocooning, what a lot of people have realized is that we actually don't need these massive overheads. We don't need all the space. We can do so much more with so much less. And if you look at it from a cost perspective, uh, not only is that a great thing to, uh, to potentially eradicate, but you're also thinking from a practicality perspective. I mean, I don't know how many people have said to me, gee, I've suddenly got two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening that I'm not sitting in traffic and having to go somewhere uh, you know, to work or to a site visit or whatever. So we're going to see that fall away. Then the other major thing that I think is going to come out of this is something called wellness tracking 2.0. So we're going to see... Uh, almost like a wellness passport of, of 
some sort. And, and this is still the big discussion as to, you know, is it going to be a physical passport, which I don't think it will be, because that once again is a point of contact, a touch point that uh, could potentially be a contamination point. But it could be something like an, this, uh, this Aurum ring. It could be something that is embedded into your system. Because look, about, look at your, your, your devices right now. If you've got a device, uh, like I've got a, a wearable a device that tracks your heartbeat, your, uh, your pace, your, you know, all your uh, key data about your body. Um, that's kind of taking this one step further. So will there be a time that, uh, you know, your wellness will be taken into question when you're attending an event, when you're engaging with people, will you have to kind of almost uh, provide your viral count electronically or even, you know, in some other way to, to kind of assure people that you're engaging with that you're kind of almost like a safe person. I think there's a very good chance that we might go down that road. Uh, the other opportunity as well around this kind of technology is that you will generally get a chance to get a sense of the mood of the room. You'll get a chance of the mood of the audience um, because if your heart rate rate goes up, you will be able to monitor excitement. You'll be able to monitor quite a few things. So I think understanding people's wellness position uh, and these kind of things is going to going to be uh, quite a big thing going forward. Then we're going to enter into the, sta the space of low touch and high tech. So the one saving grace that we had, and once again, this is one of these things that people sort of throw around quite regularly during this time, is the fact that technology has been a, a saving grace in this space. If this had happened 20 years ago, uh, I think we'd be writing each other postcards or, or we'd be engaging with each other on Mixit or I don't know. It would, be, it would be a very different experience. The fact that we have this kind of technology to do these kind of things has been a big saving grace in terms of dealing with a pandem pandemic of this sort. And we can talk about how widely available it is and, and if the internet is fast enough. But the fact that we have it and there's a, a proof of concept means that we can scale it up and we can take it one step forward. So the, the entire concept of low touch is going to become a big thing. And just think about all the physical touch points that you have during an event right now, from registration to the coffee station to the little trinkets that are sitting on tables. I mean, it, if you look at it from a sort of a, a pandemic perspective as we're experiencing right now, it's, it's actually a bit of a nightmare. And the real question is, how do you start dealing with that high touch, that high touch approach? And how do you start making it more low touch? So we've already seen a company uh, in the US develop uh, robotic arms that almost mimic um, and, and track through AI the movements of some of the best chefs in the world and are able to reproduce dishes and cook in such a way as if that person had cooked it. So will we see kitchens, maybe from a catching perspective, start adopting high tech in the near future where your food will be prepared by, by no human hands? You might have a supervisor, you might have somebody overseeing it. And take that idea and start translating that into a myriad of different other avenues or other things happening in the event space where it becomes um, low tech. So instead of having a registration desk with, you know, name tags that have to go into a lanyard, that have to go into a, a paper thing, you know, is that going to be a simple bracelet or a ring that people just swipe somewhere and it gives you their data and they're registered and they're done? So there's no high uh, touch point. Uh, I think it'll also probably also bring about the importance of, of people RSVPing to events that you have to know who's attending, once again, who, what their viral count is like and what their health status is. Augmented reality is one of the big questions that has come up over the past uh, couple of days um, in the series of these conversations. And, and that thing that's also, once again, very close to becoming uh, really great. And I think what's, what's interesting with a lot of this technology is, is that we've seen a lot of sort of the Nokia 3310 version of the hologram and the virtual reality headset and the augmented reality. But because there's never really been a reason to really push it forward, I mean, like, the 3D printer has been around since the 80s. Uh, but yet it's been like just a hobby thing that's stood on people's desks and it hasn't really uh, done all too much. So this kind of uh, scenario, once again, is kind of pushing the world to uh, adopt this much faster, putting money towards making this much better. So augmented reality, Microsoft has developed a fantastic pair of goggles that are going to become even more interesting that are going to literally project uh, stuff into midair. And the application of that, once again, is open to, to your imagination as to how you would use that. Um, but the one thing that I'm really excited about, I think, is the, the virtual reality element of it. And uh, Cameron, if you can bring up that virtual reality slide for me. Uh, this is a fascinating thing. I mean, this has been around for about uh, two years, so since 2018. Once again, sitting in the wings, probably uh, of interest to the fringe, uh, the tech savvy, uh, you know, some geeks sitting in a living room somewhere. But this is essentially Oculus uh, venues. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, 
tap into this virtual reality venue. And right now, it's a bit better than just somebody sending you a video clip and watching it in a virtual reality, but I think it could be even better. And I think this kind of a scenario, once again, is going to fast track that. But essentially, what it allows you to do, and I'm sorry I can't show you a video clip on this because Zoom isn't the best platform to show you video clips. But what it lets you do is it lets you sit in your room with a VR headset. It lets a friend of yours sit in their room with a VR headset. You both have these little avatars that are sitting in the stadium that are watching the soccer game. And you can actually chat to each other, even though you're not sitting in the same place at the same time. So I can turn to Cameron and I can say, hey, Cameron, how awesome was that goal? And Cameron goes, oh, that guy doesn't know how to kick. And we can hear each other in real time watching the same soccer game. And it feels like we're sitting in the stadium. Now, where I see this kind of almost becoming a bigger thing is, you know, will we see stadiums being built with full on 360 degree cameras placed in each seat? And we'll be able to buy tickets to that seat, almost immerse ourselves into that stadium and watch the, the, the soccer match or whatever in real life. It, it, sounds, it sounds bizarre, but we're already seeing the first indication of what that could look like. And it's just a matter of time that that becomes a more immersive experience. And that for me is, is probably one of the most exciting developments. And if you get a chance, check out Oculus venues. They, they've just done a three-day music festival as well. They're doing a lot of stuff with um, also uh, sort of a mixed reality kind of setup where they've got a small audience sitting at the actual venue, at the actual event. So you've got a comedian, maybe with 10 or 20 people in the audience, and then the other 1,000 or 2,000 people uh, connect uh, through VR. Uh, one of the other big... Uh, you know, hurdles to get over is the is the uh, pro proliferation of the actual technology in people's houses. So everyone's got a TV at the moment, everyone's got a mobile phone at the moment, but not everyone's got a VR headset. So from an events perspective, it might be um, a bit of an exercise to get uh, VR headsets penetrating households to such an extent that it almost becomes like a, a done deal. Like everyone's got a blender at home, everyone's got a VR headset at home. But uh, the thought of not having to deal with catering, your security issues go out of the, or the window. I mean, there's a lot of other things that come with it um, that make it quite an attractive kind of platform to, to, kind of, to kind of grow and build. I see there's also some uh, comments and questions coming through. So if you've got any, please do, do fill that through. Cameron, if you can uh, bring up my, my, my next slide there. Holograms is the other big one. Holograms, once again, has also been one of those things that's been more of a novelty kind of thing. Um, you know, and there's also been sort of fairly okay executions on it. Uh, and we, we're looking for that, that sort of uh, iPhone 11 Pro Max execution, not sort of the Nokia 3310 vibe that we're possibly getting at the moment. I know somebody who attended a, a holographic uh, presentation of somebody who'd passed away five years ago, brought back in hologram to do a speech at an event and it cost them $100,000 in Vegas. Uh, we're going to see that change as well. I think the costs are going to come down, the quality is going to go up. The more demand and the more interest there is for it, uh, the more I think these things are going to grow. Because the reality is as well, even if we come up with the most spectacular event and we've got you know, all the hand sanitizers in the world and all the masks in the world and, and we've taken all the necessary um, uh, health precautions, the question is what are people prepared to attend? And that's the other thing as well, is that people are going to be concerned about their health. They're obviously going to be concerned about any other pandemics that are going to come along. And, and, and I'm quite confident that this is not the first and this is not the last one we're going to see. So a lot of these things are going to start happening in our life. We're going to, you know, we've seen Emirates now introduce a, a mandatory health check as you get onto planes. So these are not sort of things that are just going to come and go. I think there's a lot of things that are going to stick with us. So the hologram, once again, is going to be one of those technological features where you might be able to bring in a speaker from overseas without having to fly them here, pay for their hotel accommodation, pay for their s &T, uh, and and it'll be as close to real life as, as you can imagine, uh, getting better and better as the technology evolves. Cameron, if you can... There we go, cool. And, and then micro shells is the other thing. So uh, in lieu of, of us wanting to venture out, uh, this is a, a company that's developed a sort of a prototype of a potential sort of uh, filtering system that we can wear. Uh, it might not look like this. There might be various different versions of it. And once again, being the kind of uh, species that we are, we're also going to be having the, the, the Louis Vuitton, the Gucci version of this. So it's all going to be about brand and what kind of uh, you know funky filtering system you're wearing. But it's going to be one of those uh, necessities that might come out going forward that if we want to have that physical interaction, that physical connection with strangers, mostly people that we don't know, 
Um, this is going to be one of those concepts that we're going to have to get used to and think about going forward. It might not look as, uh, as bulky as the, one, the, as the micro shell, but it might be something quite similar to that. Brilliant, Alex. Thank you so much for those insightful uh, pieces of information. I, I cool. think there's a lot of things there that uh, really stood out for me, like this micro shell. I, I don't think I've ever conceived something like that, but it makes so much sense now. Uh, from, from our previous days as a paramedic, a lot of the, the paramedics have some form of micro shell in order to intubate a patient because that's largely the most dangerous part of treating a patient who, who has coronavirus and COVID-19. So I think that's super impressive that that's come up. Holograms is not something I expected, but I, I think all of us have seen some form of hologram, specifically with that Google uh, video where that lady was able to speak Japanese in a hologram and be projected anywhere in the world. And it was live translating. And, and a way we can see that um, that technology be, being embraced today is in the form of Zoom's collaboration with Otter. I don't know if any of you, by a show of a, a letter, or sorry, a number one or two in the chat, have you heard of Otter? It's O-T-T-E-R, not the little fluffy animal, it's the, the transcription service. So that transcription service is basically an AI. It will take whatever it is we're saying in the session and it will condense that down into text. It's got about an 80% accuracy. So I'll, I'll include that in the notes when we do our post-event summary. Uh, Alex, is there anything else you'd like to add from a couple of the questions? I, I saw a couple of the people saying that these events, these virtual events or these hybrid events are, are quite difficult to pull off because there's so much more detail, so much more need for attention. Would you like to touch on that real quick? Yeah, look, I mean, I, yeah, I, I totally realize that. I mean, I've been, as I say, I've, I've been in the event space, produced events, you know, dealt with, with AV companies and, and catering companies, all of that. And, and really, look, it's really taking... Uh, that experience into something that is very, uh, you know, very tech-based. And as I realize, you're going to have to have a high broadband. You're going to have to have way more technology people involved in your business than, uh, you know, sort of just people planning and booking uh, suppliers, which, which does take it to a whole nother level. But the reality of an event is, and if this is going to be our reality for an extended period of time, is that an event gives you an experience. And a Zoom call is great, and there's various other versions of this. There's Skype and there's, you know, all these kind of these video conferencing kind of things. But it's not an immersive experience. It's, it's us having a chat over a, a platform and it, and it kind of fills a gap and it plugs a hole and it does what it needs to do. If we want to take that to the next level where people walk away from an experience and say, wow, that was amazing. Or guess what? I've got a ticket or I've got access to this fashion show or this game or whatever. And I'm going to be sitting on my sofa tonight with my VR headset and I'm going to be I'm going to feel like I'm sitting at the Allianz Stadium in Munich, or I feel like I'm sitting at a particular venue and taking it all in. And I've really got something that is a quality experience. Then that's kind of where it's going to go. And, and once again, we, we can't also just base our decisions on what we know right now, because right now, yeah, the stuff isn't a hundred percent or great, or, you know, it, it's kind of, like I said, like the cell phone industry was when we first started, it was all quite, you know, clunky and slow and, and all of that. So, I think as we start fast tracking these, we're going to have more and more people coming in, making it cheaper to do, and, and the quality is going to increase as well. So yeah, right now, it's, it's a real hurdle to jump over, uh, but I think it'll become something that'll become more of a standard rather than, than sort of like a novelty or like a, a, a gimmick kind of experience. Brilliant. And what I'm hearing from that is supply and demand. Naturally, TVs got better where there was a much higher uh, demand. And obviously, people stepped up to the plate and started making cheap, affordable uh, technology. And quite quickly, I might add, 